only a tiny fraction of the millions who visit Pompeii each year bother to stop at the neighboring site of Alplantis. Those who do visit make their way to the Villa of Popeia, a sprawling suburban estate as impressive as any mansion in Pompeii. The villa is exceptional both in its size, it has well over a hundred rooms, and in the beauty of its frescoes. It's also remarkable for the fact that it was probably owned by Popeia Sabina, the mistress and second wife of Nero. Well over a century old, by the time it was buried by Vesuvius, the villa was expanded several times, most dramatically with the addition of a statue-lined decorative pool more than 60 meters long. At the time of the eruption, when it was undergoing yet another renovation, it may have been occupied only by a small maintenance staff. In any case, the absence of human remains inside suggests that the entire household managed to escape. As in most traditional Roman houses, guests entered through the atrium, a room with a central skylight above a shallow ornamental pool. The walls were decorated with frescoes of imposing columns and doors, adding a sense of palatial majesty to the room. Again, as in most Roman houses, the primary spaces for entertainment and display were just inside the atrium. One of these was the triclinium, or dining room. Although the dining couches that line the walls are long gone, the walls still ripple with architectural fantasies. Especially by lamplight, these must have seemed like windows into a world of impossible grandeur. The neighboring salon opened onto a terrace with sweeping views over the Bay of Naples. You can still see plaster casts of the wooden doors, shattered and buried by the debris of the eruption. On the adjacent wall, preserved almost to ceiling height, is the most spectacular fresco in the entire uncovered part of the villa. Although it may distantly reflect the great palaces of the Hellenistic East, this fresco was never meant to represent a real building. The soaring colonnades, like the peacocks perched below them, are nothing more or less than evocations of exotic splendor. If she was indeed the owner of this villa, Popeia must have sat beneath this fresco many times, looking out over the paths and terraces, descending to the sea. At least once, when he visited Pompeii, Nero himself may have joined her here. That would have been in 64 AD, the year before Popeia died, supposedly at Nero's hands. But in this, as in so much else about Nero's reign, it is difficult to separate fact from legend. Speaking of legends, this month, the mobile game Raid Shadow Legends, this video's sponsor, celebrates its third birthday. To mark the anniversary, I made this helpful list. Three places Toldenstone viewers might play Raid Shadow Legends. In line at the Vatican Museums. At any ancient ruin with decent cell reception. Or even at your own desk, perhaps while taking a break from cleaning Roman coins. Wherever you play, you can click the links in the description or scan the QR code on screen for two special birthday bonuses. For the next 30 days, all new players will receive a special promotional package worth $40. Three free champions, Misericord, Tiger Soul, and Romero, along with 10 Magic XP Brews, 10 Force XP Brews, and 10 Spirit Brews. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. And all players, both new and existing, are entitled to a free birthday gift worth more than $25. To claim your gift, just click on the link in the description and enter the promo code 3 years raid. Back to the villa. Just behind the main reception rooms is this small courtyard with richly painted walls, which was planted as a garden. The three rooms that made up the villa's private bath were clustered around the courtyard. As in public baths, there was a frigidarium, a tepidarium, and a caldarium, a cold room, a warm room, and a hot room. The caldarium pictured here, was heated by furnace-warmed air channeled beneath the raised floor and through terracotta tubes in the walls. The caldarium was painted long after the reception rooms, 
when the grandiose imaginary landscapes seen in the atrium and dining room were no longer fashionable. Instead, we have monochrome panels framing scenes from Greek myth. The central scene here shows Hercules performing his eleventh labor, retrieving the golden apples from the Garden of the Hesperides. A short distance from the baths is another courtyard, which originally featured a fountain. As you can see, the walls were painted with stripes, much simpler than the lavish scenes that decorated the reception rooms, and an indication that this was a more utilitarian part of the house, likely occupied by slaves. Just off that courtyard, however, is a line of finely decorated bedrooms, which may have been designed for distinguished visitors. You'll notice that this room, like the baths, is decorated in a more minimalist style than the reception rooms, with delicate miniatures and framed panels. The decor in the neighboring room is similar, but with a color scheme dominated by that famous Pompeian red. In the decades before the eruption, the size of the villa was more than doubled by an enormous addition. Although much of it is still buried, the uncovered portions, like this tall corridor, illustrate the scale. Impressive though its size and sumptuousness were, a Roman villa was always meant to be viewed as part of a landscape. Courtyards like this were filled with statues, trees, and flowering shrubs, all artfully blended, to emphasize the owner's cultivation and mastery of nature. The gardens are long gone now, and almost half the building is still underground, but the rambling immensity of the Villa of Popea still impresses. Yet here, as usual around Pompeii, it's the details that are most rewarding. Please consider checking out my book and my Patreon, and stay tuned for the Friday video, which follows the intertwined stories of Pompeii and Vesuvius. Thanks for watching.